there's something else I want to do. All right. So welcome, everybody. This is the second day of our live programs on the Praxis Ideas Festival. And we are recording them so people can hear them later as well. Today, it's actually, I'm very excited because we have Mark Frank, who is an American journalist. He has lived in Cuba for the past almost 30 years, I think. Works as a freelance writer for Reuters, the Financial Times, and others. And he also wrote what I consider just probably the best book on Cuba. It's called Cuban Revelations, Behind the Scenes in Havana. And I think it's a remarkable book. And I just learned so much about the history of Cuba and what's been going on since we've been alive and up to today. So I want to encourage people who hear this to get that book. It's really uh, very complete. So um, this is part of the Practice Ideas Festival, which is going on now. I just extended it until past Christmas because I want people to have enough time to watch all the videos. So welcome, Mark. We're really delighted to have you with us today. It's a pleasure. So I want to ask you uh, something that we were just talking about a little bit before we began about this protest that happened on July 11th that, and what that was about and the anticipation that it was going to be even a bigger one on the 15th of this month. And of course, it fizzled. Um, can you tell us what the first one was about and why the second one fizzled? Well, it's, it's a lot. because There's a lot of people still trying to figure out all the details. But basically, on, on July 11th, a, uh, a, a Facebook group made up of people in Cuba and outside of Cuba called a protest in a fairly small town called San Antonio de los Baños, uh, which is right on the border between Havana and Artemisa. And much to everybody's surprise, lots of people turned out, a couple hundred or hundreds turned out. And people put it up on internet and started, and then and very quickly it began to spread to other areas. Uh, July 11th was probably one, was really the worst moment in the crisis that Cuba has faced for the last couple of years. The crisis is based on their own problems. It's based on much more drastic uh, Trump administration uh, sanctions. And it's based obviously on the pandemic. And it came at exactly when the pandemic was at its worst here. And it came uh, when blackouts had begun to happen again in Cuba, which people really hate and are very difficult to live through. And so it began to, and it came in a time when it's very hard here right now. Uh, you know, it's nobody's starving and nobody's dying. Not too many people are dying, but there's shortages of food, of medicine and everything else. And there's long lines and it's a very difficult period. Okay, But it came at, at, at the worst moment. And, and of course, people were frustrated as young people hadn't been able to go out of their homes basically for two years because of the pandemic. People have been cooped up with their kids for two years because of the pandemic and, and on and on we go and all these other problems as well. So it began to catch on I and then there was this massive deluge, which I got to witness the fake news coming from Miami and the United States, I assume psychological operations, fanned it. And so it began to spread and uh, the Cuban government at a certain point, about two or three in the afternoon, got on television and said, basically the president said, go out in the streets and stop it. And in fact, they stopped it in about an hour. But the fact is that in that process, there's probably 100,000 people in a country of 11.3 million. About 100,000 people or a little bit more participated in different ways, some very peacefully, some very violently, and there was some real confrontation with both the police and with civilians who supported the government. Can I ask you something in the midst here? Um, how often or do you think there was much of a um, influence from Cuban exiles who are opposed to the Cuban government in that protest or involved in organizing it? Well, the, the U.S. government over the last three years or so, 
for four years has, has they've now allowed internet in, into the country. And most people, certainly young people have it on their phones now. Mm -hmm. The US government has launched a whole series of different initiatives, some publicly funded that we can show you who funds these initiatives, um, basically looking to stir up resistance to the government and calls for democracy, human rights, or, or whatever. And the US government also runs a whole series of training processes outside of the country for young leaders from a number, from a number of countries, in, in, including Cuba. So, so they're certainly very involved, though they may not have been the ones who pressed the button to start it. They started pressing buttons very quickly once it started. And within an hour, they were very much involved. Uh -huh. right. So, all right. And within a few hours, the Cuban government was very clear on what was happening and began to react. And they shut down the internet. They did all kinds of things, right? Um, re react to it. So, so that was July 11th, and it was by far the largest unrest in the country since the revolution, um, at least public unrest. Though, in fact, it was not all that big. And sure, there was definitely some repression by, by Latin American standards. Not that much. So, in fact, afterwards, enough. Oh, uh, Mark, I just accidentally, you, you accidentally got unmuted. Can you unmute? Oh, thank God. So, yes, okay. okay. We're back. So, so basically, that was, but it was a one-shot deal. And since then, since then, the opponents to the government inside Cuba and outside Cuba, which go from Miami to Washington, have gone, wow, you know, now's the moment when we can overthrow the Cuban government. They really understood a kind of a, it was kind of a flash in the pan, and they think it was like a fire forever in the pan. And so, and on the other hand, the Cuban government realized, well, we have to actually do a better job. So, so that's what came out of there. And so those two sides have been kind of in a struggle now for the last you know, three or four months with the US, Miami, and some people here, hoping to reproduce that moment inside Cuba, which they call you know, basically a color revolution or a social, social revolution, even though most people did not participate on July 11th. And so then we come to November 15th, which was what they hoped would be a new July 11th or more. And of course, nothing happened. Not one person went out and demonstrated, which is quite remarkable. And so, and there was a number of reasons for that, including the Cuban government doing a better job, including, I would say, you know, pretty heavy handed judicial processes against some of the people involved in July 11th. But mainly it was something else. Mainly it was that their strategy to develop their own vaccines and vaccinate their entire population in order to deal with the pandemic has now come to fruition. And as I speak to you today, 80% of the Cuban, 80% of the Cubans who are eligible to be vaccinated because there's some for because they're sick or whatever are now vaccinated with their own vaccines. And, and uh, they're reopening the economy and everything else. So it's a very different moment from July 11th. And this, for some reason, people didn't understand who were involved in this protest, mainly because they think the protests were about freedom against a dictatorship. Because they, again, they don't really understand Cuba's subtleties. Well, really, those protests mainly were against blackouts, mainly were against the pandemic, frustration with the pandemic. There, for many reasons, mainly were expressed frustration because people can't immigrate, lots of different reasons, along with some people, yes, protesting because they want more freedom. Um, and so all those things together. But basically, in the end, zero happened because it was really a, a, a virtual attempt, an artificial attempt to reproduce something that happened only once, but that played into how many people outside Cuba view Cuba. And so they figured we can do it again. And they were very wrong, as we, we all saw the other day. I mean, even I was really surprised that not one person went out and protested. But anyhow, so, but the fact is that was the case. Total normality that same day, 700, you know, already they have over a million school kids back at school, and on that day, 
the 700,000 youngest, youngest, the primary school students all marched back to school, every single one of them fully vaccinated. Okay, and you can't start school here until everybody's vaccinated. Everyone vaccinated, and, and that's very important, obviously, to normal people with kids or, or, or whatever. And the same day that they announced that the tourism was now open again, that they had opened all the airports and money started flowing in again to the country, that same day they chose to do this protest. So, you know. Yeah. And it's oh, very yeah. untouched with the Cuban reality, uh, which shows one, the people who were involved inside were fairly not listening to their own reality, and that many, many people involved were outside the country telling the people inside the country that they should go out and demonstrate, even though it was a very different situation. You know, this is interesting what you were just saying that the reasons for the protests are interpreted from the outside community as against the regime, not against a blackout, not against not having vaccines. They think any protest means there's a, a opposition to the regime. And it's just like a protest here might be against the war, but it may not be against the regime or the government. And yet somehow it's always interpreted that way. Uh, before I open it up to questions, I wanted to ask you something else because one thing I saw when I was in Cuba is how, or, or learned, I didn't know about it at all, is how advanced the medical research is in Cuba and that there are drugs that have been developed for like diabetes, for instance, that we don't even have. And I was very interested to learn more about that. And I just wondered if you could tell us anything about uh, medicine and um, medical care in Cuba. Sure, I mean, when, when, when the pandemic hit on top of the Trump sanctions and on top of their own problems, um, they had to decide here how they were going to deal with that situation. And they decided to play to their strengths mm -hmm. to deal with it. And their strength is, in fact, uh, pharmaceutical development, biotechnology development, and their healthcare system. Okay, it's one of their strengths. And so they didn't join the, the WHO program or anything. They said, we're going to not only make our own vaccines, and this is like a poor third world country, right? Uh, and under all these pressures, we're not only going to make our own vaccines, but we're also going to make as much as possible our own medicines to deal with COVID. Because we don't have the money to do anything else. And two, because we can do it, right? And so they set about very, very early, as soon as the pandemic began almost, and before it really hit Cuba, they set up very early this, this massive program within, within the system with weekly meetings with the president that still go on to this day and the scientists and the healthcare system and everything else to fight the pandemic. And they did a number of things. One, they went from three testing facilities here to 17 one in every province, one in everything else, to be able to test themselves. And they did that with the help of China, actually. They developed finally their own, you know, whatever to do the, do the tests. Um, they, they started using, in fact, help from the private sector. They started building their own uh, ventilator machines. Um, and they started making their own medicines. And so they've had, over this period of time, they've, they've had about eight or nine different protocols on how to deal with COVID based on their advances and advances that they learned from around the world about how to treat COVID. And 80% of all medicines used to treat COVID patients here are Cuban made. Okay, and they have a, they have a, uh, a death rate of 0.78% compared to 246 in Latin America and one something in the, in the world. So, and, and that's a combination of their, of their medicines that they themselves developed and their way that, and they're learning every week how to use those medicines better as they deal with COVID. That process, along with the health system that can very quickly absorb and use um, because it's a preventive system and everything else, and, and very kind of, it's well-oiled compared to a lot of Cuba. 
uh, and can very quickly move to put into place whatever new developments happen at the scientific at the scientific level. And that's just COVID, of course. So they have five vaccines, uh, three of which have been approved, five vaccines against COVID. I don't know what's kind of overkill, except the fourth and fifth are kind of different. The fourth, which is still testing is nasal, and the fifth is something else, I guess. It is. I don't know why they have the fifth, frankly, but they do. But anyhow, so, so, but anyhow, they have these five vaccines, three of which they're using now. And in the last three months, the number of, and they've done this massive campaign. They're vaccinating people per capita faster than any other country in the world because they have this, you know, preventive massive system here. And so they they vaccinated about eighty percent of all eligible people in three months, basically. And the number of COVID cases has fallen by ninety seven percent, and the number of deaths by about ninety five percent in that period of time. Obviously, there's some other reasons. A lot of people got COVID and they, they have some resistance. And of course, um, there's some evidence that, that, and this is all Delta, by the way. Um, oh. and, and, uh, and, uh, and some of it is because, of, you know, there's enough size now to say that it goes in cycles and other things, but it's very clear that the, wherever they do the vaccine, it all disappears basically. So I'm sitting in Havana now and for the first time in two years, I really feel fairly comfortable. There was only 15 cases today in a city of 2.3 million people. Oh my God, that's incredible. At, at least reported. Again, you know, we all know that the reporting is not exactly the same. It gives a good indication, but the spread, which is a better indicator, has gone from very, very high to nationally about 2% at, and in Havana less. So, I mean, very clearly, it worked. They, these vaccines work along with, you know, everybody. There's still social distancing. There's still mask wearing, including in the schools. Uh, and, and you know, they're combining the two. And now, with it, their strategy is that you have to have 90 or 90 percent or more of the people vaccinated to really gain immunity against Delta. And that's what they're going to have within by the end of the month, more or less. It'll be up to about 90 percent. And then you have to combine that with still doing other things, you know, the, the, the ABCs of prevention. And then you have to revaccinate every six months. So has their ending, and of course they can do that because it's their own vaccines and not buying it from anybody. They're in fact exporting it now. So, so basically what they're doing is they're starting to revaccinate already the first responders who were the first to get vaccinated and tests and everything else. And everybody's going to be revaccinated. It's already all planned out over the next six months. And then they'll probably, and then they'll see how that works to keep it going. But the idea is to keep a high immunity for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's how you beat the bug. And there's no other way to do it. You know, that, and we'll never, we'll never get 90% in, in the States because we have this anti vax group of people. So I envy what you're able to do there. Um, I, I think I'll let people, you know, ask questions if they want. Um, does anyone want to ask anything? And if you do, Mike, uh, unmute yourself when you ask. Great. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering a couple of quick things that just popped into my head when you were talking. Um, when you say when you said everyone just now, do you mean what do you mean? How young in age? I'm just curious. When you say everyone vaccinated. Okay. There's there's two. Uh... Okay, there's a certain percentage of, of the Cuban population. It's probably about a million people, a little less. So it's about eight percent, maybe, of the, of the of the Cuban population who have certain uh, health problems or other problems, which mean they can't be vaccinated. They're they're trying to figure out what to do with those people, but there's a there's a certain percentage that just for health reasons can't be vaccinated. And also at this point. Um, they're vaccinating everybody from two years old up, but they're already doing trials on infants. Why? Because the type of vaccine they developed here with has, to, has a platform that they've been using for 30 years here to vaccinate the kids against all the other stuff, right? That they've been vaccinating and they have 18 vaccines, 18 different uh, 
childhood diseases that they vaccinate kids for by the time they're five. And so it's the same platform. So it's, it's a really safe platform. And so even though they're being cautious, they have a lot of confidence in that platform. How they, how they develop this vaccine is how they do all those other vaccines that they do here for, for many childhood diseases and, so, and that they export. And so, and, so, um, and so they're now doing that. But for, at this point, anybody under two <laughs> And any, anybody with certain, you know, physical problems can't be vaccinated. Everybody else, and, and then also the other thing is some individuals who for religious reasons or whatever decide they don't want to be vaccinated, they're not being forced to vaccinate. So it's, it's very hard because of social pressure. I mean, you know, it's almost everybody. So it also probably doesn't really matter if 10 out of every, you know, 1,000 school children are not vaccinated. I don't know what the percentages are, but there is a certain percentage for religious reasons or for whatever reason. But there's no anti-vaccination movement here because frankly, people here are not that dumb. And, they've gone <laughs> through, and frankly, they've gone through in a more recent period of history from having been exposed to every, every one of those illnesses that exist to thanks to vaccines, seeing their kids all become extremely healthy and have the lowest, you know, infant mortality rate or whatever rate up to five of anybody in Latin America. So they have a great, great deal of faith in the vaccines and they have a great deal of faith in the scientists who make the vaccines, right? And so it's a, it was an intelligent strategy. And at the same time, the Cubans developed actually an export product which now resembles gold if you look at, at Pfizer's profits. And so they now have, they're now beginning to export those, but they're also exporting the patent at, you know, basically without, you know, because they have a certain self narrative that they have to live up to if they want to or not. And so, uh, and so they're also doing that or they're, they're, they're no match for the uh, big pharmaceuticals in the Western market. But they are a match for them everywhere else, or in China or in Russia. But you know, you go to Africa, you go to you go to the Middle East. One of the vaccines has already been produced for a long time now in Iran. Um, or you go to Asia, Vietnam's about to start producing them. Or you go to Africa, where it looks like Kenya is going to start producing them. And so, so basically, you know, they developed a very valuable export product as a as a secondary thing. To develop a products that in fact are going to protect their own people at a very low cost, by the way. Like, you know, there were not billions of dollars spent to develop these vaccines. There was almost mm. nothing spent to develop these vaccines. Mm. So. I, I did, that's a, quite a great answer. But if I just tag on one little thing, and you don't have to, not right now or just during the discussion, but you, you quickly said something that just caught my attention. But you said that a lot of people uh, don't understand the, the subtleties. Of, of the Cuban government. And if you, at some point, just, I, I don't understand the subtleties. Maybe if you could talk about it at some point, uh, you know, today, or you don't have to do it right this second, but I'm just curious what you what you meant by that. People don't understand the subtleties. So, don't, don't understand the subtleties of Cuba? That, that, well, that's what you said. Uh, you said at one yeah, point, I know, you said- you know, If they, I understood them, I'd be very rich, you know? <laughs> I've oh, only been here like, 35 years and my wife, my Cuban wife only has like, you know, 18 aunts and uncles and 50 cousins who talk to me. So, you know, well, I still have no idea what's going on, but I'll okay. try, I'll okay. try. I think he was referring mostly to the demonstration that happened on July 11th that uh, people didn't understand. Oh, no, I, I was referring, I actually, I was referring to things like what I was just talking about, their, their, their medicine, because somehow most people really, Joe Biden, the Biden administration a week ago, just a week ago, actually went and knocked on the door of the Cuban embassy in Washington and offered to donate to them a million vaccines. What, you know, how could they do that? I mean, what are they doing? And of course, with a lot of little, you know, what ifs and what ifs and what ifs, you know, checks and balances and stuff. And so the Cubans responded, well, I don't. I guess you don't know, but we just finished vaccinating our whole population with our own vaccines. So that doesn't work for us. 
But then they proposed to the Biden administration that the Biden administration pick a country in the Caribbean or Latin America and donate their vaccines that they were offering to Cuba, donate those vaccines and match it with another million and donate them. And I think you were probably referring to Haiti. You know, oh, to what, Haiti, yeah. Yeah, what 1% vaccinated. What are they doing offering those vaccines to an 80% vaccinated country? That's bizarre. No, well, they so don't know. Strange. But so, really, that did happen. You can look it up in, in, in the news. I mean, it actually really just happened a week ago. I hadn't heard that. Do we have, uh, looks like Ray wants to ask something. Uh, yeah, I mean, you covered a lot of it there. I was basically going to ask about the the nature of the uh, how they developed the vaccine and the platform that it was. So maybe you can explore that a little bit more. I, you know, I'm thinking, well, we have this MNRA, you know, Moderna and Pfizer platform versus the uh, supposedly more conventional Johnson and Johnson platform. And uh, I don't know what the other countries are uh, have done in that regard. You know, apparently there's some concern about the efficacy of, say, the Russian vaccine. And uh, uh, so, if you could explore that a bit more, so it's more more like a regular flu vaccine. You know, what injected in eggs and grown or something. You know, how do, how does that work? And uh, okay, I'm not a scientist, but it's basically called a conjugated vaccine versus a versus a whatever they call the the genetic the uh, genetically engineered vaccines. So the, the the ones like Pfizer, they use it. They don't use any material from the actual virus, right? To to create a reaction, they actually make their own material and put it in that vaccine to make the immune the immune system react. While the type of vaccine that Cuba uses, they actually take a little bit of of the virus and use that in the vaccine to create the to create the reaction. I mean, that's about as far as my science goes. And that's you, the, you mean like that's a, a like a killed a, version, huh? Like a killed version of the virus? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Like the polio uh, vaccine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's I like understand. How, it's like how all vaccines were more or less made until recently. Right. Uh, more more or less the methodology is the same. But the other thing is the Cubans have kind of a little bit their own. They call it a platform. How they take that and then put it into into other materials that then become the the vaccine and, and they have a very developed process it is i guess somewhat the same as i mean there must be something special about it because it's patented and 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 you know they're they're giving it to countries that haven't been able to make it right, right. the basics of it that's the basic you know the the nut the nut of the base of, of it is instead of you know using Genetic engineering, you actually take a little bit of the dead vaccine or whatever it is and uh, of the dead virus, and that's how the vaccine is built. And, and, then, and then I wanted to ask too that the, uh, the, the essentially the social acceptance of you know both the uh, you know the vaccines historically that have been used and then the health system overall really has facilitated this as a as kind of a, a of a general, you know, everybody's already used to it. It just was another kind of vaccine that they had to get, and and uh, off we go to the races. So so they accept and, it very and, easily. Versus and what to, we've got here, yeah. And you have to add to that that it's being administered by the family doctors, right? The right. family doctors are you know who take care of maybe a thousand families or whatever. They're the ones who, so I went and got my vaccine, right? So I go trotting off to the corner, you know, to some cafeteria or some government building. And, uh, you know, all my neighbors are there too, uh, including the one guy who's kind of like a homeless guy. They're all there being treated equally. And they're all know, they all know the people there and are saying hi and chitting and chatting and everything else, right? Plus they know exactly who came and who didn't show up. And on and on we go. So it's very local at the end, right? It's very decentralized at the end. And that also gives people confidence because they know the people giving it and, and, and everything else. So you just go and, you know, it's like you're hanging out in the afternoon at the beach with your friends almost. I mean, 
So we were hanging out under the palm trees, waiting for our turn, basically, seriously, beautiful. I have a nice picture of it. And then you go in and, you know, they say, oh, hi, Mark, how are you? They check you off. Nice to see you, pal. And you go in and then the nurse, who you also know, says, sit down, sweetie. Look the other way, shoot. And then you go to a third person who you don't know who says, ask you a few questions. Then you sit for 45 minutes and then you go home. And they marked that you were there. To, you know, my proof of vaccination is a little piece of sweaty cardboard. That's what they used. I mean, this place is broke, remember, broke. A little piece of sweaty cardboard with a, Mark Frank was here on this date. Mark Frank was here on this date and Mark Frank was here on this date, the three, the three shot process, right? And that's it. That's what I have is proof of vaccination at this point. They haven't, I don't think they've been giving out a better proof yet. But it's so but it works if I have to come back into the country, they'll know, hey, yeah, that looks just like mine, you know. But it's ridiculous. I, I've saved it because you know it's so funny, but it shows that you know, even the poorest country, if they get their act together, it's amazing what they can do with nothing. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's so impressive about and one of the very impressive things yeah. about Cuba. Do we I mean, have a what, are the, what are the logistics involved in vaccinating, you know, eight million people around the whole country? The the production, the materials needed to administer it, the, the trucks needed to move it, the refrigerators needed, it's it's normal refrigeration too. It's no nothing like you know, the problem with Pfizer is it doesn't work in Africa because you have to spend as much on getting a new infrastructure yes. to protect the vaccine as you spend on the vaccine. So whoever, you know, whoever is actually supplying the refrigeration systems for Pfizer, you should definitely buy their stock. But anyhow, so, and it's just normal. So you just ship it over there and you can use any refrigerator, you know. So, but it's still huge logistics in the middle of like this disastrous situation. And it is a disastrous situation. But in the middle of that, they were perfectly able to manage that. It's quite remarkable. So, uh, and so you know, so that's the vaccines. Okay. Any um, anyone else want to add something? I'm looking up here. Uh, I wanted to tell everyone also if you want to be on uh, well, Mark's mail well, just a second. If you want to be on Mark's mailing list, um, what's the best way for them to do that, Mark? Just uh, just write out uh, MSF Cuba. Gmail. Let's That's put that in the chat box. Um, what is that again? M S F Cuba at gmail.com. I uh, I posted it in the chat and I think Bill had a question. Okay, go ahead, John. Uh, Bill had one. Okay. okay. Am I, can you hear me now or? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, yes, I'm changing the subject a bit from the uh, vaccine to the, uh, the economy. This, it's an issue that's puzzled me for a long time is the, uh, the difficulty that Cuba has had to, in moving towards self-sufficiency with regard to food. Uh, and which I find quite surprising because uh, puzzling, because um, given that there are fewer than 12, 000, 12 million people and they have a rich country, uh, experts have suggested that the uh, properly managed the uh, agricultural resources could support uh, maybe six times or more of the population. So they have had consistently problems in production and distribution. Uh, and they have, as uh, you pointed out, uh, Mark, in, in your book, Cuban Revelations, that um, uh, Raul Castro in 2007 uh, raised these issues about the absurdities in, in some of the uh, distribution and, and production, and that declared that Cuba needed to move towards self-sufficiency. Um, the, they continue to import uh, uh, considerable uh, amounts of food products. Uh, what surprises me in particular is that the uh, 
import of poultry products um, is as large as it is. It's roughly equal to, uh, according to some statistics that I found, roughly equal to their export of tobacco. Uh, and I just wonder, chickens, my goodness, I mean, chickens ought to be pretty easy to raise. I just wonder whether uh, you could uh, talk a little bit about uh, the uh, commitment of the government to self-sufficiency in agriculture and food production and why they continue to have these problems. And I'm, I'm somewhat aware of the history and I know they've had these problems from the revolution on, uh, but what's happening now with respect to self-sufficiency? Okay. okay, first of all, it's kind of interesting. I, you know, because I have covered agriculture here for a long time and covered sugar here for a long time. And I know lots of Cuban experts on agriculture and et cetera. Um, so one thing I did at a certain point you might want to do is I tried, I tried to find out what percentage of food the Caribbean imports compared to Cuba, and especially what percentage of food the Dominican Republic imports compared to Cuba. Because basically the rest of the Carib, you know, Cuba is about population-wise, about a third of the Caribbean, and then Dominican or whatever it is, the Dominican Republic is a little smaller than Cuba, but has more or less a population equal to Cuba, et cetera. So what I found out, and you can go check it yourself, is that while Cuba imports probably 60% of its food, the Caribbean imports 40% of its food. Okay, and while Cuba imports 60% of its food, uh, the Dominican Republic imports 20 to 30% of its food, okay? Um, in terms of yields in Cuba, they're the worst of everybody pretty much across the board, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So why is all this? Well. There's a number of things that are interesting, as you may know. First of all, when, when they had the agricultural reforms after the revolution, unlike other communist countries, they kept 80% of the land for the state. So yes, they did re redistribute 20% to farm workers and everything else, but they kept 80% for the state. And the, states, the state throughout history in any communist country does not do a good job with agriculture for a lot of different reasons. And to this day here in Cuba, the private sector, as small as, as it is, does much better in terms of yields and everything else than the state sector. But they've had an extremely difficult time. And they've also, up until fairly recently, been very allergic to foreign investment in agriculture because the revolution was based on throwing out the foreign companies in agriculture because you had about, you know, very few companies owning 50 or 60% of the arable land in Cuba. So it was very, you know, very much, a, you know, just a few huge landowners and everybody else was nothing. So as they, they were very, they've been very allergic politically to going back to foreign investment in agriculture. And for political reasons, they really have not um, been willing to really redistribute the land again. So, so what do most specialists say here? Well, you know, really in the end, they think that they should take a lot of that state land and not like rent it like to, to, to people who want to like use it, lease it as a those leases were working for, you know, basically, uh, you know, sharecropper type stuff, you know, where, yeah, yeah, the, the owner gives you the land, you produce, but X amount has to go back to the owner at a very low price. They've advocated for a long time, you know, really loosening all that, if not actually giving land back to the private sector, allowing people not to rent that land, but it's their land. And, and that's gone a long way. So they, they started, you know, eventually, especially with a lot of the land that they didn't even use, you know, half the arable land here was fallow, all of the, of the state. You know, so they began to like um, 
rent it out, basically, or lease it out for free to would-be farmers, but it wasn't their land. At first, they leased it out, you know, and it's only X amount of land you can have, and then they first they leased it out for like 10 years, and then it's now 25 years. And some people say, you know, even that's not good enough. It's very hard for a farmer to develop far, farmland if they don't feel it's theirs. End of story. So the, the basic position here is that they really need to redistribute that land in a way that makes anybody who's tilling it feel that they're really the owner and that they have a right to do what they want with their crops. That doesn't mean they, they're not going to sign a contract to make sure the hospitals or whatever get it cheaper or whatever, but they still need to let go more than they've let go. They've let go, they've let go a lot. The, the old system was basically the state gave you all the inputs, the insurance and everything else, and you gave the state 90% of whatever you produced. And, you know, it was a disaster. And so then it changed to uh, now it's, you know, loosening up. And then they loosened it up and then they tightened it up and now they're loosening it up again and basically trying to get rid of, there was a state monopoly that, you know, gave the farmers at a low price the inputs and then took all the output. Well, that doesn't work when you can't give them any inputs anymore because you have no money. And so then how, how can you expect the farmers to do the same? So now there's this big struggle by the farmers to use that moment to gain more control of their land and of their produce. And that's correct because that's the only way that they're gonna really be able to advance. But the government still has a hard time with that politically, psychologically, you know, they still keep throwing money into these state farms that basically haven't proved themselves for years to be where they should be putting the money. They should be putting it into the private sector. And so those things are still going on. And then they've also had some very strange laws here, you know, like you're not allowed to kill your own cow or sell it or even eat it. You know, and, and, they, had that, and, they, and they just finally changed it. I talk about it a lot in my book. Okay, because if you look at the statistics, that law that you can't, you know, it, it says a lot about Cuba because you tell a farmer, okay, you can have cows, but you can't kill them and you can't sell them except to us. Okay, well, how are you going to check to make sure that's true? Well, you need somebody to go around inspecting and counting the cows. But how are you going to stop that inspector from being in cahoots with the farmer and keeping a calf in the barn and then dividing it up? Well, you need an inspector of the inspectors. And then, you know, and on and on you go. And how can you prove that that cow that was hit by a train was not really hit by a train? And how can you say to the farmer, well, you shouldn't have eaten it even though it was dead? And you can go on and on. So a really dumb law that had a good motive. They said it was so that the milk got to the children, right? Okay, but in the end, what happened? They, the, cow, the, the herd of cows never increased. And in fact, it began to decrease and the milk never really increased. It got up to a certain point under the Soviets and after the Soviets, straight downhill. So proof of the pudding that I'm right is they just changed the law this summer. And now you can do what you want, what you want with one cow out of every three. So if you have 10 cows and you manage to get the 13, you can take one and kill it and you can sell it wherever you want. Otherwise, yeah. that you can't have your cow and eat it too. <laughs> yeah. So, but so, you know, there's certain things that are kind of strange. But listen, I, I investigated that and they're not the only ones who are strange because the Swiss, to preserve their chocolate, all cows have to have a certain diet. Oh. Uh, the chocolate and, and foreigners can't own, own cows in Switzerland, so it's not only the Cubans who are crazy. So, anyhow, so um, are they, but the, the, are they making progress toward import replacement? Are they really making progress toward self sufficiency? Right now, it's just the opposite. Right now, their production is fine because they have no fertilizer, they have no pesticides, they have no fuel, and etc. But they're making changes that should, in better conditions make progress, including the farmers now, because in some ways they have to start buying, they have to buy, you know, this whole other problem here, which is right, currency right. and hard currency and their peso right. and it's a whole other issue. But basically they're making reforms that should prove to, to be incentives 
to improve production, but only to a point because they still haven't gone as far as they have to go. And that's because there's a struggle within the system about how far to go. And that's been going on for 10 years about all reforms in Cuba. So they've certainly, if you look at Cuba in 1993, and you look at it today, it's like another country completely. Yeah. And they've, I have made a, huge, and they've, they've made huge progress in all kinds of areas. <clears throat> but if you look at Cuba and you compare it to some other countries, you might say, well, they, they've done nothing. But that's not the case at all. They've, been, they've moved along a lot in all areas, really in some ways with the exception of agriculture, because the original reforms of Raul are the only reforms that were taken out of the program. Because, and I could explain why, but I take a little while. And so now they're being put back in, but they lost like five years at least because, or more because there was such a blowback from what I call the rural mafia that, that, uh, that even Rao couldn't resist it. So, but now again, because of the crisis, they're moving forwards, right? So they're, they're using the crisis to like try to blow over a steamroll and get rid of everything that's holding back that process. I have a related so, question. They have a long, long ways to go and it is a disaster and you're completely right. I have a related question to the self-sufficiency, sustainability, and so on. Uh, we, the world faces, of course, the looming catastrophes of climate change. I wonder in Cuba, how much discussion there is of climate change and plans for how they will deal with climate change and what they, how they think climate change will affect them and so on. And what might we, that is the world, uh, what might we learn from Cuba about how to face some of these issues? <clears throat> well, Cuba, Cuba for a long time now has been talking, talking is different from doing, has been talking about the dangers of climate change and educating its own people about climate change from kindergarten on up. And it's something, it's a national program coordinated by top scientists and everything else and presided over by the president called Project Life, Project Vida. Proyecto de Vida, no? And don't say, so um, basically they have mapped out completely what they think the effects of climate change will be. And for example, now when a hurricane comes along and wipes out a town along the beach, they won't help them rebuild unless they move inland because that beach won't be there in 10 or 15 years. Okay, and so, so they're, very, they're very well aware of it. Uh, at the same time, they're the last country in the Americas in terms of, of the percentage of green energy compared to fossil fuels. Yeah. Okay, so 95% of their energy is still produced by fossil fuels. And they say they're trying to overcome it, and they are. I mean, they're, they're building windmills, they're building uh, larger you know, solar panels and stuff like that, but it's just the very beginning. And they, they say they would like to get up to like almost 30% you know, green energy or whatever you want to call it by 2030. But that's a very difficult thing to do. And, and it's one of the few sectors where actually foreign investors can come in and own 100% of the investment. But they have to sell the electricity to the Cuban state electric company, you know, that you know pays them if they feel like it. So, you know, um, so it's a bit complicated, but the fact is that, you know, they certainly are 100% aware of it. <clears throat> they certainly politically, you know, and they certainly say, they also think that the developed countries really need to help the other develop and especially in the very active with the smaller islands that may disappear completely or through, you know, the islands that will be really hurt the most from climate change, they basically blame it on you. And those hurricanes that are getting stronger and stronger and stronger, they blame it on you, not them. And, and uh, et cetera, though they accept that they have to do whatever they can possibly do to deal with it. And I think more and more they themselves are becoming conscious of that, but they made the same mistakes as everybody else in terms of 
you know, until, and especially the Soviet Union, uh, they, they made the same mistakes all the way up until basically, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, when I think they became very conscious. And Fidel Castro gave a big speech at the UN or something 30 years ago about climate change. Um, so, so, so they're very aware of it, but being aware is different from being able to do anything about it. Seems like um, there could be a lot of um, work on solar panels in Cuba because there's so much sunlight. And another thing I wanted to bring up that we noticed because we visited an agricultural cooperative when we were in Cuba. And it seemed like that could be a wonderful development would be cooperatives in that sector. And yet there wasn't really much support for it. And that, I never understood why there wasn't more support for cooperatives in Cuba. It seemed like a natural move. It is. And in fact, now they've just made them, and now they've just opened it completely up again. And they've actually, for the first time, you know, gave them the legal cover of being an official business. Hmm. Okay, that's and, and that's and that's the same with all the small companies now. All, all the people who they used to call people who work for themselves or whatever, the law now says that they're all becoming private businesses, officially legally private businesses for the first time since the late 1960s. Uh -huh. And they totally opened up the cooperatives again. And there are cooperatives both in agriculture and here, and there is amongst the private sector. You know, somewhat of a movement towards more, uh, you know, less chemical use in agriculture, right. in part because they're, they're catering to the higher end restaurants and they're catering to the higher end, actually, tourists who want organic food and want organic, safe vegetables. Yeah, the so, cooperative we went to uh, was organic. They grew huh? food. The cooperative we visited there was growing organically. Yeah, yeah. And so I think it's more and more. Now, why do people resist it? Because uh, one of the things you learn in Cuba, certainly, is that no matter how, you know, how idealistic and how much overall the government has a progressive position, the bureaucracy and people with vested economic interests are another kettle of fish because they're human beings and they tend to act like normal human beings when they have a hold of anything of value. So, so basically it's an ongoing forever struggle between you know, rising, rising ab above our worse nature to our better nature. And, and it goes on and on and on and it goes on and on and on in, in Cuba as well. And it's very complicated, even, even in a small country like this, there's plenty of like bureaucratic resistance to everything. So, so and that's real, even if, the, even if people at the top are the most wonderful, whatever, 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 it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. Human beings are human beings. And so, um, and you can learn that a lot for, from being in Cuba, but there are ways to do it and there are ways to overcome it, but it's nothing easy to do. And so, um, you know, for lots of different reasons, uh, there's been a, it's, they've been slow, in my opinion, at the climate change stuff, even though they're not slow at all in understanding its importance in trying to do what they can do. But again, and I think they also just, I think it comes a little bit with this idea, climate is anybody, we don't matter in the world, we have nothing to do with climate change, so why would we be doing all these things? Because Really, just mentally, right? I'm sure a lot of people think that, you know, what, what are they talking about telling us what to do? You know, we're responsible for 0.0001% of the carbon emissions in the world. And the people who are responsible for 50% are telling us what to do. So there's a certain political resistance, I think, as well. That makes uh, sense. Basically, they demand it's fine. You give us some money to do it. Because you, uh, you stole it from us in the first place. We've got and a. Uh, you're making, and you're making us pay for your problem because you developed with this and we never did. So, you know, what are you doing? So, you know, I think we'll take a, maybe a last question from Ray. Uh, yes. And again, uh, uh, Mark, you did, uh, you know, as soon as I thought of the question, you started to, you know, to cover it. Um, but, but the basic idea was 
with their awareness of climate change, wouldn't they really be pressuring to uh, go full on, you know, organic in the uh, in the agricultural sector, you know, to be able to both expand their food production and to generate the kind of sustainability and resilience that you would need in the face of climate change, which could then economically be facilitated by this kind of cooperative structure uh, tied to the land distribution, redistribution you were talking about. So it, it seems like there's a real, there's a real collection of uh, puzzle pieces that fit nicely together, um, you know, in a larger review. So I uh, just wanted you to try to go a little deeper in that. Yeah, no, that's why I like these conversations because it really forces me to try to think a little bit, you know, which is always nice. But anyhow, so uh, basically, look, first of all, right now, I promise you, all the vegetables and fruit I eat are organic because there's no import, there's no imports here right now of stuff for agriculture. And I also know it because everything is so like small and full of bugs. And I don't care. I eat it anyhow, and I'm just fine. But it's, but it's hard to wrap your, your mind from being an American, it's hard to wrap my mind around, you know, eating, you know, stuff that I might have thought was rotten and really isn't rotten at all. Or, or is do, it do, do the bugs in the fruit count as uh, protein but, input? Trust, trust me, anybody in the States pretty much would be horrified at what I now eat. Right. So we're all, we're all organic here now, like it or not. But look, it's a lot, they, they actually, you're talking, it reminds me of something. They do have model farms here and stuff that are organic. And they do have a whole huge company that produces organic fertilizer, pesticides, and everything else. But the farmers, as a rule, think it's bullshit. Uh, and they don't believe in it. Uh, even though they all believe in magic and they all believe in green medicine in Cuba, to some extent, but they just don't think that you can, you know, really do a good job of growing anything if you don't kill everything to do it. And so, and so they have been like working on that and trying to change farmers' minds here for a long time. And and actually, this crisis is helping them to do it because the farmers don't have any fertilizers, so they either go with nothing or they have to go with what they're offered. And what they're being offered is very organic. Trust me. So, so, uh, so it's not like they, they don't try, but it's, 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 there's been this ongoing battle in Cuba since I've been here. So, it sounds like they should be promoting organic through the health ministry, which has credibility with people as a health measure and use that as the angle to generate trust because that's the, the entity that has the trust of the people now. Yeah, but the problem with that right now is if anybody starts promoting how to grow food, everybody will laugh in their face because there is no food here now. Nobody cares what it is because there's no food here. It's day by day, including for me. Okay, so it's not like a situation where you go eat a nice food because people will eat anything they can get their hands on right now. No, no, what I was trying to say is that the process of developing farmland organically becomes a health measure for the people. And, and then you get, you know, the health department recruits the people who are believers enough that want to be farmers on that, that then create the kind of demonstration farm that shows efficacy and promotes health. And then all of a sudden you start to have a, a, a snowball of, of public support. That was kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. I, I would agree with you 100%. And uh, I don't know if they do that at all or not, because I don't, you know, I don't, I don't really look into it that much personally. But, uh, but it certainly is what they ought to do. And it makes perfect sense to use the health system, which is fairly trusted here, compared to uh, it makes perfect sense. But you still have to convince the farmers. And, okay. and, and you know, so... And, 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 you know, so, but basically, uh, they have to do it, they're going to have to do it whether they like it or not overall. And, and, and their position right now is self-sufficiency in food. And they really are pushing it, and they're pushing everything, including our own fertilizer and our own 
whatever their own whatever but but so it's not it's like uh, but they're just you know again they're you know we, they should also you know they try to convince Cubans not to eat you know a cholesterol killing diet or a diabetes creating diet which the Cubans love and it's very hard to convince them trust me and so, so when you uh, say what what kind you, you were referring to uh, every day it's a, a challenge to get the food you need to get so explain a little bit about that i'm curious and then maybe what what you eat what you're able to get well it's very simple cuba imported 60 percent of its food right up until two years ago and cuba imported a huge amount of inputs from fuel, pesticides, fertilizer, and put a huge amount from a abroad. And then almost overnight with the pandemic, they had no money. And so now they're importing maybe half of the food they used to import, and they're producing maybe two thirds of the food they used to produce. And so, it, you know, do the math, and there's not enough. And 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 it's it's that simple. And so basically, because it's kind of Cuba is kind of divided into two groups of people: people who have some kind of access to hard currency from family abroad or whatever, and people who are stuck with just the Cuban currency. So if you have access to the hard currency, you can manage to a complicated system of the informal markets and everything else. So you can manage, you know, to survive, you know, fairly decently if you're willing to pay the price. And everybody else is literally, you know, having to base their lives on a combination of the World War II ration, which still exists here, mm -hmm. along with whatever they can put together in other ways. Um, and, and that's the way it is. So for example, chickens, well, chickens eat corn, right? And that's how they make eggs. Corn prices in the world are double or triple what they were two years ago or a year ago. Plus Cuba has no money. How are you gonna feed the chickens to make the eggs? Ah, eggs are the basic staple of the poor here in terms of protein. Ah, and so, so basically, uh, that has created a situation where there is not enough. It, nobody, I have yet to see one kid who's starving or anything like that. But the normal Cuban is spending a huge amount of their time now just trying to scrounge up what they need. And their diet has changed, they, which for the better, I guess. I mean, they're not using nearly as they're not eating nearly as much fried food as they used to or nearly as much, you know, cholesterol, you know, but butter, there's no butter here, or milk, there's all, you know, that type of thing. So, so in, the, in my case, because I'm, you know, by Cuban standards, a multimillionaire, even though I'd be in poverty in the States, here I'm a multimillionaire. Uh, and also, if you want to buy anything, you have to go stand in a line for hours to get whatever it is. So, you know, that's all out for me. I haven't been to a store in two years, <laughs> I swear. So how do I eat? Well, I still buy my produce and my fruit at the market. And I go to the most expensive or one of the most expensive markets where the produce is actually fairly expensive even by US standards. But that's where I go. And I'm also living alone, which really helps. And for the first time, I have no dog, which also really helps because I, if I had a dependent, I'd be much more upset because I would really have to go every day and make sure my dependent ate. But since it's just me, it's, you know, the stress is off. But so basically, I just kind of make do. So I make do by going to these markets that I know about, you know, we all know about them, the market down the street or whatever, but wait, everything is more expensive. So I buy, I spend whatever I have to spend to get you know a few tomatoes and a few whatever to make a salad or whatever I'm going to buy you know some bananas or you know food or you know whatever fruits I'm going to buy 
uh, that are there because lots of fruit is never there. But you know, whatever's there, I can buy. You know, I eat a lot of string beans these days and squash. Believe it or not. <laughs> but anyhow, so but any I manage to find enough fruit and vegetables to keep a balanced diet, more or less. I get a bottle of yogurt from the countryside every week. That's not actually that expensive, and I don't ask how they manage to make it. <laughs> and they drop it off. And they drop it off at my house, and I mix it with my fruit, and I put in some honey from the countryside, and that's my breakfast, right? And then for lunch, whatever I've been able to get my hands on, you know, I eat. And for dinner, you know, something lighter or whatever with vegetables or whatever. And so I manage. But I manage by going to these markets and then by basically throwing money around to anybody who has a way to get whatever I need, right? So, so, so I it need all butter. works out. And then what the other thing is very important is everything in my house, whether it's toilet paper or soap or uh, clean detergent or butter or whatever it is, if it's not perishable, if it ever appears, because things appear for a couple of weeks and then they disappear for months, <laughs> believe it or not. So when it appears, I buy it for like three months. So everybody else is doing that too. So it gets, you know, you know, so you start hoarding, you hoard because you're forced to hoard. Well, that's what Otherwise, people did here during when COVID started. People started hoarding. Yeah, but here it's been for two years. And so and so it's 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 not that difficult for me because I'm one person, but I'm always thinking like months ahead. And whenever I start getting low on any essential. I'm asking everybody I know, everybody, you know, you see it, just let me know. I'll pay whatever the hell I have to pay. And I know enough poor people and enough like crooks and everything else because I'm a journalist. I'm allowed to know these people. Um, I know enough crooks and everything else that I can usually get whatever I want. But never, it's all very expensive. But since I'm only one person and, you know, I don't have any other great expenses, you know, it's not the end of the world for me. Uh, but everything is, you know, it's, it's because of the shortages more than anything else, everything has become very expensive here, including, I'm sorry to say, at the restaurants, because they have to buy those inputs too. They have to do what I do, right? And so like pork, right? A staple in Cuba, pork used to go for 30 or 40 pesos a pound. It used to be fairly abundant. Now it's scarce. Well, that's no amazing. Feed. No feed. And now the, the cheapest you're going to get pork for is 180 pesos a pound, more or less, which is bought, which is at the black market rate about three dollars a pound, and at the, the Cuban rate about six or seven dollars a pound. In a country where the north, the average wage is six thousand pesos, or which equals at the at the 6,000 pesos a month, which, which equals at the Cuban rate, uh, at, the, at the informal black market rate, it's about, it's about $100 a month. Uh, so whatever, but so, so you get the idea, right? So basically it's a constant struggle and it is very expensive, but for somebody who has no other real expenses, it's no big deal. But, I, but if I had to find milk, you know, for a dog or for a baby or for a grandma, you know, it'd be really stressful mm. and hard and very, very expensive. And if I had a dog, because I've always had a dog my whole life, and this one, the latest street dog I had, thank God, ran away three years ago and I never got around <laughs> to finding another. But thank God, because I, I had to feed that dog Cuban sweet potatoes mixed with ground up beef for pork, right? And there is, there is no ground up beef or pork anymore in Cuba. It's like almost impossible to find. That's you know, amazing. So, so what the hell would I feed to start? I mean, you know, first I'd have to find the sweet potatoes and then I'd have to figure out some kind of protein to put in it. It would probably have to be eggs or something, but there's no eggs, except for if you have a ration and I don't have a ration because I'm not Cuban. And so on and on and on. So believe me, it's like bananas. I've been here a long time and it's definitely crazy. However, <laughs> You can spend a lot of time just getting your food every day. <laughs> but it's not like the special period. It's not like the depression after the fall of the Soviet Union. Right. It's, right. it's not as bad. People say it's as bad, and in some ways it is, in some ways it's not. 
But overall, just statistically in terms of the economy and in fact in daily life, it's not nearly as bad as it was in the early 90s when I was also here. But it's very, very hard. And for me, the hardest thing here has been with the pandemic, there was no way I could get out of the country. The airports are closed and stuff. So what do I do if so, somebody in my family needs me? I can't get there. And that, that really scared me. It's the first time I've ever been scared in Cuba because you know I really felt helpless, you know. And now, now the airports are opening up again, but for a long, long period, they really were shut down. It was very, very hard to get out of here. Um, you'd have to have a humanitarian reason, and even then, very, very hard. Whether, whether it was back to the States or where some of my Cuban family lives in Spain, very, very difficult. So, but yeah, so it's not been an easy couple of years here, even for me. And for me, it's been a picnic compared to for a lot of Cubans. So there's plenty of people here who look better than me, but overall, it's still been a picnic. And I have a car. You know, my car is 20 years old. They won't let me buy a new one unless I want to pay eight times the factory price. We all have our gripes, even though I still think he has got a lot to offer the world. But so, but anyhow, but I do have a car, and that means I have a mega yacht compared to most Cubans. So well, we're going to, we're going to uh, finish up at this point. I don't think we have any more questions, but I, this has been really interesting, Mark, and I think all of us have learned a lot about what it's like living in Cuba right now, as well as, you know, what's been going on around COVID and the whole economy. Yeah. So I want to thank you for all this, and uh, I'm probably going to stop, unless you have something you really want to say, I'm going to stop the recording. Is there anything you... Yeah, but, yeah one last thing. Listening to me, you've heard I've had a lot of criticisms. Well, that's because Cuba is real. It's not a fantasy. But that doesn't mean that Cuba should be destroyed or that it should be embargoed or that it should be bombed or anything else, right? Cuba has many wonderful things about it, as I also talked about, and many negative things about it. And the problem is, is when people only focus on one or the other. Because the real world is never like that, just like you and me aren't like that. And so the important point I just finally want to make is that it, it's a real living place with uh, 11.3 million real living people. And so, of course, it's complicated. And of course, it's got good and bad and everything else because it's real. Uh, and, and that's all because I don't want anybody to misunderstand my criticism. It's not... I'm not a hypercritical or a hyperlist. I'm, you know, trying to be as objective as I can. Well, I'm talking to you because I feel that's my responsibility. Well, I think you, you're very, you're very uh, realistic with us, and I think this the the group that listens to you that's here on this program totally understands that and understands what you're doing, and is not we're not either or kind of people. Yeah, I, I realize that, but you know, okay. we're not on the internet or whatever. whatever right, but this is being recorded, so I'm glad you did say that. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and we can still stay on for a minute or so.